Welcome to GS Podcast number 126. I'm Stephen Knight and I hope you're all well. Very pleased to be bringing you audio of the panel I was on a couple of weekends ago at the Battle of Ideas down in London at the Barbican. Firstly, a massive thanks to Claire Fox and the the whole team there for organising that and and bringing me in. It was an incredible event, lots of open discussions on lots and lots and lots of different topics. The word lots comes up a lot when you're talking about Battle of Ideas. The great thing about these debates that are put on there as well, there's a massive emphasis on inviting the audience to ask questions and join in. So it's, it's a very open, free-flowing, debating, no-holds-barred kind of event, and I really enjoyed myself. Um, so what you're about to listen to is a panel the title being From Bakers to Burkers, Religious Freedom Today. So I'm not going to provide a post-mortem before you listen to that. I did speak quite a bit about this on an episode of Taking the Myth that I've recorded with Iram. That should come out in the in the coming days, so you can, you can hear my thoughts on it there. Needless to say, I think I may have derailed this debate um, inadvertently, in a way. Um, we all had five or six minutes to make some opening remarks uninterrupted. And I kind of made a throwaway line about infant circumcision. Uh, I was kind of reeling off ways in which religion enjoys special privileges and treatments. Um, And I I think I said, um, I I, I actually said I don't even have time to talk about infant circumcision. So good luck explaining that to the aliens. And then my first question from the moderator was about circumcision. Several questions in the audience was about circumcision. Uh, Panel members weren't happy about the questions being about circumcision. So it really um, prodded a nest. So I'm actually fairly happy about this. So listen to it. Let me know what you think. Please share it around. So this panel also contained Ed Hussein. Ed's someone who I have wrote about on my blog before. He's, I, I think I wrote some critical articles on him because he's, he chose Darwin Day to publicly announce himself as an evolution denier. Um, and I want to agree with Ed because he's a staunch opponent of Islamism and he does this from within a Muslim context as well, which takes, takes bravery. Uh, so I admire him for that. It just turns out he's also a very narrow minded and conservative Muslim as well. So I think some of that may come across on this panel. I think he, I think he says my way of thinking may lead to the fall of civilization. So that's quite a big charge um but enjoy uh send me some feedback let me know what you think uh you can keep up to date on this very podcast at gspellchecker.com and you can support it at patreon.com forward slash gspellchecker enjoy my name is john o'brien i'm the president of catholics for choice and i'm delighted to be a sponsor tonight today of the panel from Bakers to Burkers, Religious Freedom today. Um, Historically, religious freedom was considered an essential right associated with freedom of conscience, and the 18th century saw significant philosophical and practical expansion of the right of individuals to practice different religions as they saw fit. In recent years, uh, it was 2011, I was very surprised to see that the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops had established um, a special ad hoc committee to defend religious freedom. I presumed that it was because maybe an evangelical pastor in some part of the world had been thrown in prison, or maybe somebody was burning Bibles somewhere. But no, um, the religious freedom that the bishops perceived were under threat came as a result um, of a case brought by the ACLU in the United States, which challenged the idea that people could receive Um, charities could receive government money and refuse to provide certain services. So, for example, that you would treat um, people with HIV but not give condoms to people who tested positive who wanted them. Or you would be dealing with refugees. In a refugee situation, people often find themselves in very difficult, unprotected sexual situations. So refusing to give, for example, emergency contraception to people in those circumstances, or indeed in terms of employment, the idea that someone would have to adhere to certain religious um, beliefs in order to be hired by um, your company or your group. Um, That situation has went on with religious freedom being cited um, in a controversial way on both sides of the Atlantic. 
um, in the United States. Um, we had a case about a baker's refusal to bake a cake for a same-sex wedding. Um, in Northern Ireland, there was the refusal of bakers to put a message, um, what they perceived as a political message, um, on a cake. Um, similarly, um, we've had situations that um, are, to say the least, you know, unusual or different. In Iceland, um, politicians have begun to argue that um, the practice um, of um, circumcision, which has existed um, for a long time, a long period, and is part of many religious traditions, that that practice should be outlawed. Um, is that an attack upon the religious freedom um, and the beliefs that people have? Um, the Telegraph, um, Boris Johnson, joked recently that a woman, a woman wearing a burqa looked like a letterbox. Um, is that a disrespect um, for people's religious um, and personal beliefs? Um, so to unpack these issues today, before we go to you, the audience, to hear what you think, what you believe, and what you're concerned about, um, I'm delighted to introduce um, our panelists today. On my right-hand side, we're going to begin with Ed Hussein. He's a senior fellow with Civitas um, and a global fellow with the Woodrow Wilson Center in my own um, uh, hometown of Washington, DC. Um, he's author of The House of Islam, A Global History, and the best-selling memoir, The Islamist. Um, Ed, let's begin with you. Thank you very much, John, for that warm welcome. Thank you to all of you for being here. I'm always in admiration of people who have a wider bandwidth beyond President Trump and Brexit. So being here on this uh, Saturday afternoon means a lot. Um, I want to begin by confessing that this is not an easy subject. There are no black and white solutions. And anyone who pretends that they know the answer to all of these difficult and tough moral questions is either excessively self-confident, selfish, or somewhat arrogantly deluded. But all of that said, I, I also want to put on the table something that Imam Malik said in the, uh, in the 8th century, that nisful ilmu la adri, half of knowledge is to say that I don't know. Um, but that said, we're in a situation where we have to know, we have to have answers, and we have to have conversations that are guided by principles that allow us to come to a better conclusion. So in the seven minutes or so that I've got, I will put um, three points to you. Uh, the first point is that for the last thousand years of human history, but particularly here in the West, there has been a tension between two broad groups of thinkers, writers, indeed artists, and uh, those are first the religious collective and second is those who advocate for individual liberty. On the side of those who have wanted the domination of the religious collective, for the last, last thousand years, we've seen an influence and a battle play out. So whether it's um, in, in the Muslim world, someone like Ibn Rushd or Averroes, or before him, uh, Ibn Sina or Avicenna, or before him, Kindi and Al-Farabi, and a whole group of others, these were thinkers, philosophers who, who, who protected Greek thought, developed it, and then helped pass it on to the West. But those were, in, in many ways, individualists, or, or those who called for greater individual freedom to think freely. Their influence on the West led to people such as uh, St. Thomas Aquinas and the tradition that came out of that whole uh, plethora of thought. Now, St. Thomas Aquinas was at first heavily criticized by the religious collective. The church would not accept his views and beliefs. It's only in the last 300 years or so that he's been accepted. Now, on the religious collective side, we see this constant history of persecution, whether it's uh, the, the free thinkers, or more, la uh, more latterly, you know, William of Ockham, or whether it's uh, Galileo, whether it's Newton, or indeed John Locke and others, we see a constant history of persecution. Now, it's worth bearing in mind that on the other side, with those who have sought greater human freedom to think, and think with reason and the light of revelation, and try to reconcile the two, because those, who, those of us who call for greater individual liberty have never been uh, at least in large measure, disregarding religion, but wanting to bring religious revelation and reason uh, close together so the human mind and the human society can prosper. Those of us who have been on that, side of the, on that side of the ledger have always been on the receiving end of persecution. And whether it's uh, about the rights of women or slavery or gay rights, or indeed the, the freedom of the people that I mentioned to think freely, operate freely without the religious mob, uh, and religious fascists breathing down the throats of those great people. What's interesting to note is once the cultural and political shift occurs, 
for greater women's rights, for greater rights of religious minorities, for sexual minorities, or for the, abo uh, the uh, abolition of slavery, you suddenly see the religious uh, collective coming right behind it and saying, we've always wanted this too. So it's always worth bearing in mind that those of us who are calling for greater individual freedom to think now are often the avant-garde and the, and, and, and the trailblazers, and it's often those who want to, uh, a greater religious collective impose catch up. So that's my, that's my first point. My second point is that, you know, whether it's the, the, the individual liberty-seeking camp uh, or whether it's the religious collective camp, God is not... Christian or Muslim or Jewish or Buddhist or Hindu or even atheist for that matter. And so all of this is often done in the name of God and trying to please God and enforce God's view and God's opinions. It's often man's opinion and it's literally man, not, not always women. It tends to be men-made interpretations of scripture. It tends to be men-made ideas or man-made ideas that are then imposed in the name of God. And not, a mo not for a moment can anyone persuade me or anyone in this room that God actually is either Christian, Muslim, Jewish, or anything else. God transcends that. So uh, it, it's also, if we had to choose on, on which side God, if any, I mean, he's the master of the cosmos or, she's the, or it is the master of the cosmos, it doesn't get involved in the minutiae of these kind of debates. And this is something that Ibn Sina said and others subsequently held up. But it's worth bearing in mind a verse of the Quran that says, نَفَخْتُ فِيهِ مِنْ رُوحِي that I blew into Adam's soul from my own soul. So repeatedly in scripture we find if God is on the side of any, it's not on the side of the mob or the collective or the religious fascists, but God is on the side of those individuals who seek to live their lives to the best of their own conscience and the goodness of their own hearts and know that they haven't brought harm to themselves and to others. And my final point is this, that the conversation today that we're having here is only possible because those who wanted greater religious uh, and individual liberty won out in the end. 300 years ago, I would not be sat here in front of you. Many of the Muslims and indeed Jewish people and others, atheists who are in the audience, would not be here because we would either be burnt, killed, called heretics, stoned to death, and what not by our uh, less tolerant Christian friends. And sadly, that same situation is now still pre predominant in the Muslim world. So where the West has made progress, in large swathes of the Muslim world, we, we, we do not see that progress. And I'll just end by saying that I, I've, you know, many of the points that John raised, it's interesting that in the Muslim world or historically in Muslim history, those just aren't issues, you know, be it abortion and even be it gay rights or uh, you know, the baking of a cake and so on. It's, it's interesting these are kind of Christian, post-Christian, uh, post-modernist cul-de-sacs because I, I find great comfort in the fact that if you look at the last thousand years of at least Muslim theological history, if you look at someone like Imam Juwaini, the teacher of Imam al-Ghazali, who, who wrote in the 11th century, yes, he had a negative influence on the rise of Muslim philosophy, but in terms of, uh, of scripture, I mean, for a thousand years, Muslims agreed on something called the maqasid, and in my latest book, I go into this in great amount of detail. And I end by saying that if we bear in mind those five things, yes, there's interpretation around it, but if we bear in mind those five points of, of why we have what, what's called divine law or sharia, and if we apply what the greatest gift that God gave us, i.e. reason, the greatest gift that God gave us was not his son or his daughter. Uh, forgive me if I sound offensive to the more Christian among you, but I always find it offensive in, in conversations with evangelical Christians that they're trying to ram down the thought, oh, is God's son? Well, no, it's actually the life you have and the, and the power of reason. You apply that to the five maqasid, which is the preservation of family, preservation of religion, the individual, uh, the, the preservation of uh, a, a security in society, and finally private property. Those are the five things that the Sharia sought to preserve for the last thousand years. Everything else is second tier detail and open to debate and conversation. As long as those five things are in place, we as human beings, based on the God-given uh, gift of reason, should be able to flourish without uh, religious bigotry or fascism or the mob uh, threatening us. Thank you very much, Ed. Our next, next speaker is Stephen Knight. Stephen comes from a secular atheist perspective, podcaster, blogger, and reporter for The Godless Spellchecker. Thanks, John. Um, I'm very pleased to be here to be talking about the, the line between uh, religious freedoms and, and uh, discrimination, uh, especially in the life of some really high-profile events. And I'm, I'm, I'm always surprised at the, uh, the problems religious, religions will throw up for us in the, in the 21st century. I mean, if it's, not, if it's not cartoons, it's cakes now. So there's it never a dull moment. 
Um, however, I do want to start by pointing out a bigger issue which I think underpins a lot of this conversation about religious rights, and, and that's, uh, that's religious privilege. Uh, I, no doubt many of you may have heard the expression um, that when you're accustomed to privilege, equality feels like oppression. Uh, and I think that explains a lot of what's going on in this conversation. Um, the, the godly, basically, they've had it too good for too long. Um, just to speak of England, where we are for a moment, um, England's a, a culturally Christian country. Uh, we, you know, our previous and current prime ministers have paid lip service to the idea we're a, we're a Christian nation. Um, we, you know, we, we have 26 unelected bishops in the House of Lords. Um, around a third of publicly funded schools in England and Wales have a religious nature. So this allows public funds to be used to push dogma on uh, young and malleable minds. Um, every school, even non-faith schools, in fact, must have collective worship, and that must be of a Christian character also. Um, schools can discriminate in their admissions policy based on religious grounds and in their uh, employment policy as well. Uh, even animals aren't exempt from the demands of religious primates, uh, with uh, stunned slaughter and, and therefore animal welfare uh, being sacrificed in God's particular you know, meat-based preferences. Um, so that's already government, children, employment and animals, uh, and in, until very recently, gays, atheists, women and the occasional witch. Um, so I don't have enough time to list all the ways in which religion enjoys special treatment in society and government uh, and the ways, it's, the ways in which it's allowed to discriminate and what it gets away with. I mean, I've, I've not even got round to the, the topic of infant circumcision, so I mean, uh, good luck explaining that one to the aliens. Um, the issue here is an obvious one to me. It's, it's Iron Age beliefs are, are coming into collision with progressive modern values. Uh, and, and these antiquated beliefs are, are essentially the slowest kid in the classroom. Uh, they're holding back the rest of us, and, and that includes liberal and progressive believers too, uh, and Islamic reformers. Um, and, and why do society recognise religion's lack of relevance to our day-to-day -day lives? And we just simply don't want it there. Uh, Christianity specifically is losing its, its relevance in Britain, uh, like all bad ideas should. Uh, the values of modern society have su simply just surpassed those of scripture. Um, this is reflected in downward trends in religiosity in general, uh, in numerous polls, or the decrease in actual church attendance. Um, votes in favour of gay marriage and votes in favour of the right to abortion also highlight this, uh, this shift in attitudes. So with this being the backdrop of this conversation, when religious tend to moan about their, their rights being curtailed, they're often simply unhappy at having their ideas treated the same as everyone else's. Uh, so we're asked today, where do we draw the line? And the line's already been firmly placed in favour of the, the godly, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, but I, I fully concede it's a tricky territory. And, and as a result of that, my fellow secularist and my fellow anti-theist uh, may overstep the mark on occasion in their sort of passionate opposition to all things God in the workplace and in society in general. So when we talk about a Christian-run establishment uh, refusing to bake a, a gay cake... Uh, we're, not, we're not talking about rights per se, uh, we're sort of talking about whether we think the state should be able to compel individuals and businesses to promote certain ideas, ideas that go against their conscience and core belief. Uh, and that's where it does get tricky. Um, do I think it's right that a, a Christian baker would refuse to make a, a gay cake uh, adorned with a, a pro-gay marriage? Uh, no, I don't think that's right. Um, but do I think the baker should be compelled by law to make the cake? Uh, and no, I don't think that's right either. So. To be clear, gay rights are a human right, uh, as far as I'm concerned. However, I don't think you know, having custom cakes are prerequisite for being a homosexual. Um, and gay people have the right to take their money elsewhere, and I think that they should. Um, so this isn't a perfect solution or outcome, uh, I concede, but I don't think life owes us perfect solutions to complicated and messy problems. Um, but we do our best, and we mustn't lose sight of the bigger picture, which I think is, is individual freedom. Now, if an establishment refuses service to someone solely because they're gay, black, trans, etc., now that's, that's against various discrimination laws and that the, the law should act. Uh, but once you compel businesses to promote certain ideas, you, you create a very unfortunate precedent. I mean, we could, I doubt anyone in here would be comfortable with compelling, say, a, a black tattoo artist to ink a white supremacist with you know, various white supremacist symbols uh, and logos, or you know, compelling a Muslim-run printing shop to, to reel off 400 Mohammed cartoons. I mean, as funny as that'd be. Um, so I, I submit that the problem that would arise from state intervention, intervention in these problems would be far more egregious than the inconvenience and, and hurt feelings of, of just having to take your business elsewhere. Uh, businesses should be able to decide exactly what they produce, uh, 
but not whom exactly they produce them for. Uh, and that's, that line might be difficult, that might, line might be difficult to see. And uh, it, in other ways that prevent you from seeing clearly, that, that brings me to the burqa. Um, Boris Johnson fell afoul of uh, hysterical liberals recently in, in his comments on the, the burqa or, or niqab. Uh, not many people seem to have noticed that Boris Johnson was actually objecting to the potential Danish ban on the garment. Uh, instead, everyone seemed to hone in on this, this, this mocking language about letterboxes and uh, bank robbers, I think, I think was another one. Uh, and to me, there's, there's no contradiction here in his comments. I think we can respect the right of women to choose what they want to wear, whilst acknowledging that that specific garment is a symbol of misogynistic Islamic patriarchy. And uh, as liberals, I think we, we have a duty to speak up about this kind of thing. Uh, I mean, when, when my fellow liberals condemn criticism of, of this, uh, the burqa and the niqab, but under the guise of protecting Muslims, they don't seem to spare a thought, thought for all the female Muslim dissidents in Saudi Arabia and Iran throwing down their veils in defiance uh, and finding themselves locked up, uh, or worse, uh, for their efforts. Uh, I don't think uh, they, along with those living a, a life of misery in this very country, would, would thank us for biting our tongue, so I, I'd encourage you not to. And... Um, I also push, push back against anyone who misuses the label of bigotry to weaponize shame. So, in conclusion, uh, we must acknowledge the right of refusal, uh, refusal due to religious beliefs in some instances, even when we do not agree in principle with those beliefs. Uh, the right to wear burqas and, and look like letterboxes should be protective, but we should be able to speak out in opposition to it. Uh, businesses and individuals should be able to flaunt their ignorance and outmoded views. This makes it easy for us to know where they are so we can choose to take our custom elsewhere uh, because that's what individual freedom is. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Stephen. <clears throat> our next speaker is Simon McCrossan, uh, Head of Public Policy at the Evangelical Alliance and co contributor to an employer's guide to Christian beliefs. Simon. Thanks, uh, John. Um, yeah, the debate about religious liberty is often difficult to frame as a debate as it raises a number of independent questions, namely about the place of religion in society, the role of government, public-private distinction, the limits of tolerance and bigotry and so on. And it also dra draws on a range of disciplines from law, philosophy and history. Now, freedom of religion and conscience are part of a delicate ecosystem of liberties that includes freedom of speech and association. These rights, taken together, uh, in my view, uh, protect the soil uh, of civic society which associations can sprout and thrive as expressions of private initiative and self-determination. Now one of the keys to addressing the clash between equality laws and, and freedom that uh, Stephen and others have, uh, have adumbrated about is to perhaps recognise that what we've got is a clash of worldviews and be open about it. None of us are neutral. We all have belief systems which we use to account for the way the world is and the way we think it ought or should be. But many social liberals, or colloquially known in the current discourse as uh, those in quote-unquote liberal elites, uh, do hold the view that they are, might be perceived as their beliefs are somewhat better, perhaps superseding previous beliefs, their beliefs are unbiased or somehow of more value, that traditional religious or otherwise uh, views are being challenged, uh, those views are worse, biased or less valuable. Uh, unfortunately, such groupings... Um, <sighs> Has, has given rise to a discourse, perhaps, you might say, in this country to perhaps give rise to uh, kind of a new imposition, if I can put it that way, which is damaging free speech. I mean, everyone's familiar with the Ashes Bakery case. Um, you know, the MacArthur family deliberated for two days on whether what to do when the order came in for the queer space campaign to support gay marriage on that cake. Mrs. MacArthur telephoned the man who ordered the cake to explain that the Christian beliefs meant that they could not print the particular message that he wanted, and <clears throat> Mr. Lee, to his credit, thanked them for their politeness and told the court that much in his evidence. We all know what happened next. It is worth noting, however, that a Comrades poll suggested that two-thirds of the population of this country thought that the case against them should never have been brought. 90% agreed with the statement that equality law should not be used to protect people from discrimination. Uh, sorry, they should be used to protect people from discrimination, but not to force people to say something which they oppose. Now, many of you in this room might agree with me. In one sense, which I can pack on later, I think the ruling ashes is both wide, um, sorry, both narrow and potentially wide in different circumstances, and we can unpack that um, with your opinions later. But whilst some of us might agree on many things, um, in one sense, I think we might agree on other factual scenarios, um, and cases have emerged, such as issues of civil partnership. And perhaps one case I, I would highlight is that of the regis registrar and incident in Lydian Le Daly. Um, now, whilst I welcome the Ashes ruler, ruling, I believe it's a win for everyone. I don't think we can limit freedom merely to the right not to be compelled to say things. 
Um, many sympathised with Lillian Le Daly uh, in Islington because her polite request to her employers uh, not to be designated as a civil partnership registrar on top of her long-standing job as a marriage registrar came before the law had ever changed. And they accommodated her quest, request for a long time, during which, according to Islington's evidence in court, they provided a first-class civil partnership uh, service. So as a finding of fact, in that case, not a single person was refused any civil partnership service or received any detriment whatsoever or was there any foreseeable uh, prospect of the same. Um, the system carried on seamlessly for the public whilst at the same time accommodating Lillian's request to carry on doing the work that she had already done for many years before. When her case was presented before the European Court of Human Rights, many commentators called for a fair and balanced approach to competing rights. Unfortunately, in my view, she lost. Many commentators, legal and those of faith and none, thought the court had failed to do that. Um, many felt ordering Lillian to do civil partnerships was unnecessary and felt sorry that she lost her job and was not perhaps afforded some degree of sunset accommodations. Now, these cases of injustice do and can leave a bitter taste in the public discourse, and not just for Christians, those for people of other faith. I asked the question as to whether it really helps the cause of equality to alienate swathes of people by using equality law in such a perhaps draconian and disproportionate manner. Now reflecting on some of these high profile cases, before she came president of the Supreme Court, Baroness Hale later publicly questioned whether equality law had got the balance right in these cases. In the Ashes ruling, Lady Hale stated um, that it did, it did the project of equal treatment no favours to extend it beyond its proper scope. Now, you do have real people at the centre of these cases. Some cases brought by some groups are not as meritorious as others, I, I admit that, and many, quite frankly, are unhelpfully presented in the press. From my role, though, I do know some of the people involved in some of those cases. They have been dragged through the courts and all have paid a very high personal price. Lillian Le Daly, for example, recently died at a very young age. Many of these people do not set out to mistreat anyone. They do not go out of their way to offend people. They were just going about their own business. In each case, they did not turn down a person because of an inherent feature of that person. The reason they didn't want to provide the particular service because of deeply held, widely shared, long-standing mainstream Christian beliefs. Now, you may not sympathize with Christians over marriage, but again, it's a question for debate in, in this sphere. Should a gay couple who campaigned for a same-sex marriage act be able to turn down a booking from a Muslim campaign group who wish to hold a conference at their B&B, which is also their home? to discuss the pe repealing the very piece of legislation for which they campaigned. Or, as Stephen said earlier, you know, should a printer be able to turn down a request to print something perhaps at odds with their conscience? My answer is a qualified yes. And this week, I think the Supreme Court shifted slightly towards my view, but the court's approach to equality legislation, perhaps in some quarters, is cause for alarm when it takes half a million pounds in nearly five years to reach a result, which to many was self-evident. So equality law must be reviewed. It wasn't handed down from heaven on tablets of stone. It was written by civil servants, politicians, and campaigners quite legitimately. And people make mistakes, and that's why laws can be amended. And if the Equality Act is not perhaps functioning in every great sense as it should be, and causing injustice and misery, we should look at perhaps reform. If it's unduly burdening freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom of conscience, it should be changed. So I leave you with this thought. I, I would look to think a fertile discussion around the idea of reasonable accommodation should be perhaps incorporated into equality law so that in those minority of cases where there is a clash of rights, the court is obliged to go through a careful process of assessing and balancing the competing rights to see whether some reasonable accommodation can be made for both sides. The duty would fall on the person claiming that conscientious objection to prove to the court they have a genuine, cogent, respectable and well-held conscientious belief, religious or otherwise. If they cannot, that's it. But if accommodating them would be unreasonable, then they lose. But in cases like Ashes and Lillian the Dale, the Daily, it might sometimes result in a fairer, more humane outcome. Okay. Thank you for that. an interesting proposal, so I'm looking forward to the um, audience taking that up as to what they think of it. Um, our last speaker on the panel is Helen Pluckrose. Helen is the editor of Aereo, a humanist online publication, um, and you're an occasional um, contributor to... Um, uh, journals, yeah. um, as we've seen recently. <laughs> Thank you, Helga. Religious freedom is an essential human right. It protects both the right to practice a religion and not to practice a religion. Religious people must not be penalised for having certain beliefs or applying them to their own lives. In the same way, no one should be punished for not having any religious belief or living according to one. 
Religious privilege, as Stephen has mentioned, is not a right. There is no justification for privileging, accommodating, excusing or exempting any values, actions or behaviour because it is religious that you would not do if it was secular. Both of these principles come down to the very liberal one that people must be able to do as they please as long as it does not affect anyone else. Therefore, if you wish to cover your head or refrain from gay sex or eat a special diet or cut bits off your genitals, you must be allowed to do so. However, if you wish to make others cover their heads or refrain from gay sex or eat a special diet or cut bits off their genitals, the law must protect, must protect those people from you. It is significant that we are discussing religious freedom yet again, rather than freedom of conscience, freedom of belief, freedom of choice more broadly, which includes the non-religious. Our allegedly secular society privileges religious beliefs, values and customs over secular ones. The decision to focus on religious freedom again shows that we are still prepared to consider deeply held religious beliefs as something worthy of consideration separately from equally deeply held non-religious beliefs. This is, as again, as Stephen said, an outdated hangover from our religious history and it is time for it to go. The question should not be, should religious people be able to cover their faces or should religious people be able to decline writing certain messages on cakes, but should people have the right to decide how they dress and what messages their businesses put, help put out there? This is not a specifically religious problem. I recently had a disagreement with a Jewish friend who argued that workplaces must accommodate his need for a Sabbath because otherwise Jewish people simply wouldn't be able to work there. The assumption was that his religious need should take precedent over any just as strongly held needs anybody else had. Why should the need to have a Sabbath be more important than, say, a non-religious co-worker's need to spend time with his children? Isn't the deeply held belief in the importance of regular family time as valid as the deeply held belief in a duty to observe the Sabbath? If a divorced parent only had Saturdays with his children, he could ask his workplace to accommodate this. But if it didn't, he would have to take responsibility for his own personal circumstances. Religious beliefs are a personal circumstance too. If someone's religion says men cannot touch women, as in Orthodox Judaism, or women must not shake men's hands, as in conservative forms of Islam, the believer must take responsibility for ensuring this, this does not happen. No one else should be expected to accommodate that belief or even to respect it. If you cannot touch pork or alcohol, you might not be able to work in a supermarket. If you cannot countenance same-sex marriage, you might not be able to work in a marriage registry. But what about when someone is acting as an individual or runs their own business and wants to live in accordance with certain beliefs which do not require anybody else to do anything? Can we require them to adhere to certain rules which go against their belief? I think we would need an exceptionally good reason to do so. If someone wants to cover their face, the question we should be asking is whether there is any good reason to deny them this freedom, not whether their reason for doing so is religious. If a reasonable argument that they should not be allowed can be made, for example in a place where high security is needed, this can be considered a justifiable limitation of freedom. If someone wishes not to provide a special non-essential service which goes against their principles, it should not matter whether those principles are religious or not. A Christian baker's wish not to have to write pro-gay messages on a cake and a gay baker's wish not to have to write homophobic Bible verses should have equal validity. We will forever be arguing about what is and isn't a justifiable limitation of freedom. These questions are not simple and very often cases need to be judged individually and argued out on their specifics. Often this works on a scale. If the case of a baker not being forced to physically write out values they oppose seems an essential freedom, would that also apply to a printer who would not have to do the actual writing? Or what about a translator? If people have the freedom to cover their entire bodies in public, why not the freedom to uncover their entire bodies? Is this a different matter? If so, why? I don't claim to have the answers to these questions, but I do strongly argue that to consider religious freedom separately from individual freedom has no place in a secular liberal democracy. Just to get us started, I'd like to begin and uh, ask a question of you, Simon. 
Um, you talk about reasonable accommodation. Um, in the United States of America, there was a thing called the Affordable Care Act. Basically, Obama made no-cost contraception available for folks through their um, insurance, um, their employee insurance. Um, a private organization called the Hobby Lobby uh, Company, um, Hobbyist Group, decided that they felt that their workers having access to contraception through an insurance policy, in other words, what your female worker has in her handbag for birth control pills, was anathema to their religious beliefs, and they said that they didn't want to have any part of it. In other words, they wanted to block that accommodation applying to workers in their stores. Simon, is that a reasonable or unreasonable situation that they're asking for? And when the accommodation was made, um, which was basically you could sign a form and the government and the insurance companies will look after it so you don't have to worry, the Little Sisters of the Poor said they wouldn't sign the form saying they didn't need to do this because signing the form saying they didn't need to do this was a violation of their religious freedom. No. Are we being unreasonable here, Stephen? Uh, well, Simon. that's all right. <laughs> um, yeah, so your understanding uh, of those specific cases, having lived lots of it in, in America, will be uh, more fresh than mine. Um, so the two issues there, one is, was it uh, unreasonable to seek an accommodation? Um, I think in Hobby Lobby's case, it was reasonable to seek an accommodation. This was an organization which purposely uh, had a very specific ethos. It closed on Sundays, which in America is pretty rare, right? Uh, it paid its workers 25 to 30 percent above the national minimum wage. Its rationale for, for Sunday closing was that it wanted to give its employees family time inspired by uh, their Christian beliefs, and there was a whole host of policies and practices which were quite distinct to Hobby Lobby and so on and so forth. Um, so I think the fact that an accommodation could be reached whereby the government, you know, it could be worked around to preserve those uh, livelihood, because otherwise the organization faced pain of uh, insufferable financial penalties and would have ultimately closed, I think was a win-win uh, for both parties. But I would distinguish Hobby Lobby from the Little Sisters of the Poor, if I may. Um, it seems to me that in that case where the government offers the Little Sisters of the Poor an opt-out in a similar vein to Hobby Lobby, and they seem to arrive at the rationale that, well, even to opt out of a scheme which I know is funding abortion traduces our conscience collectively to the extent that which we can't you know, work with that seems to me to be quite remote. And I would draw an analogy there with paying tax, the idea that, you know, you, your conscience would be seized by, and I'm sure everyone in here might have something to say about that, with what our tax uh, payers' money is, is, is used for. So it's only reasonable, uh, John, and when it comes to employment, you know, it's just, if you like, it's only reasonable, so it's accommodating what is reasonable subject to the test of undue hardship on employers. So it's not an absolute right, it's only a reasonable right. So it uh, just raises interesting questions for us. If a religious business um, refuses a, a reasonable accommodation, what is their ultimate agenda? Is their ultimate agenda about their consciences being violated, or do they have another ulterior motive? Stephen, I want to come to you for a minute. How is it a progressive modern belief to deny uh, people the right to a ritual that's been there since antiquity. The right to, if, if you, as part of your ritual, as part of your tribe, as part of coming into your family, your community, it's important that people have um, a circumcision. And the parents choose that and the community chooses it. How is it progressive to want to outlaw that? I mean, Cannibalism was a, a very popular ritual practice at some point, and we, we seem to have no gripes about that. I mean, it comes back again to being privileged with religion. Under no other sphere would we accept the mutilation of uh, children's genitals were it not for the strange idea in society that we should automatically respect people's religious convictions. Uh, and I, I find it very strange. And my concern really is not with the people who are, are not able to act out their rituals, but my concern is with these children who don't get a choice and, and don't have a say in this and have to live with the consequences for the rest of their life. So I think if we're talking about progressive modern values, I, I certainly think we have to start with the idea that slicing off you know, bits of people's bodies parts is, uh, is, is not in any way, shape or form uh, for, for the good of the child. It's a bit worrying to compare cannibalism, a bit unfair to compare cannibalism with circumcision. I think that's a little bit of a dodge. But also, um, for those of us who have children, when my daughter wanted a One Direction tattoo, she wasn't getting one. Um, sometimes parents have to make decisions and want to make decisions 
um, in the welfare and the goodness of their children. Bringing your child into the tribe, I would suggest to you, is a very laudable value. How can you, how, are, how is it for you to judge what other people in good conscience choose as part of their practice and beliefs in their families? Like I say, I mean, it's one of them strange practices that you would not be able to explain to anyone else in any other context. And it's one that has long lasting implications permanently. Uh, I mean, if you were to, I mean, we, we have this idea of consent in this country, which applies to any other sphere, including tattoos, which you just mentioned, there's an age limit on that. We don't apply that same privilege to making a body altering procedure to infants. So if, if we're allowing children, so should I say young adults, to make that decision for themselves, that's fine. I have no particular interest with what somebody does with their own genitals, but I think to, uh, to force that from such a young age is, is a very strange, uh, strange ritual to have. And I, I think in terms of, you know, who am I to speak out about that? I think who am I not to say something about that? How, how that's managed to work its way into society as a norm, I, I find very strange. And like I say, it's only accomplished that because it's a religious practice. You are not getting anything else through the door uh, like that, uh, unless it's under the guise of religious belief. And is it a bit strange that, you know, people could pe sh should people be more tolerant of religious practices or practices that they find to they don't adhere to, but appear to be pretty important to the religious folks who practice them? Well, I, I, I defer to what Helen said, and I think Helen put it best. It's it's a matter of personal choice. That's one way of looking at it. Um, as an observant Muslim, I th I'm, I'm, I've just come back from the Middle East where Muslims have many, many issues, many, many challenges. Circumcision is not one of them. Um, I, mean, I understand the way in which you're approaching this, but that thought process leads to disastrous consequences, and I'll explain in a minute why. But I think you know, Muslims and Jews very rarely come together, but they do come together very quickly to defend circumcision. And it happened with the Icelandic case, it happened elsewhere. And, and there are reasons for that. I mean, look, I, I was Muslim, I was young, I was circumcised. Almost all of my Muslim friends are. Those who then become atheists, they have many problems with the thought process. But uh, circumcision hasn't ever done anyone any great harm. And this is on the, in the male circumstances. Now, you know, there's lots of scientific proof to kind of make the case both ways. So I, I just think it's a real... Uh, aberration, a real kind of rat hole to go down to say, you know, uh, let's focus on, I mean, what did you call it? Mutilation of child genitalia or something. It's just that's a, literally what uh, it is. Well, that's, that's your framing of it, you know, with all respect. And you know, good luck to you for kind of trying to go down that particular rabbit hole because you, you, when it, it's just hard, I, I think, to see where it all ends up. But there's something bigger at play, and that's, that's the agenda here. And the agenda is to basically make people of faith, Muslims, Jews, and others, seem as somehow. Uh, to be completely problematic on every level because the moment you say to a Muslim parent that you can't uh, teach your children or raise your children, and it applies to people of, you know, whether Hindus and, or, or Sikhs and Buddhists and others, raise them along the lines in which your parents raised you, going back, you know, in the in, in Jewish uh, circumstance almost 6,000 years, you're almost saying that they can now long, no longer be taught about God or religiosity or family values or faith or marriage. Or, or, or all of that, and then what that leads to, and I'll finish in, in, in 30 seconds, is the complete lack of meaning in life. What that then leads to is the lack of civilization. What that then leads to is this nihilism, which Nietzsche spoke about, which means there's nothing worth defending anymore. So when your children and others come back from war, well, why do they go to war? Okay, um, Helen, the idea of tolerance, does that mean that sometimes you permit, allow, even welcome, things in a society from a secular point of view, freedom of religion, freedom from religion. Don't force me to do it, but um, if you want to do it, you go ahead. Is, is that what tolerance means in a secular society, or do you see it differently? I, I think that is what tolerance means. We, we don't have to tolerate things that we are already favorably disposed to. So uh, tolerance doesn't mean that we have to agree with everything, it doesn't mean that we have to refrain from laughing at things, but it does mean that we don't um, prevent people from doing it, we don't bully them for doing it or harass them. Okay, let's go to the audience and see what you think. Um, if I can come to this lady here with the orange Fitbit. Yes. Hi, uh, I would like to answer uh, your question or ask a question about circumcision. Because it seems to me that you you are presenting fallacious reasoning. Uh, if you see, if your group of 
cultural background doesn't see any problem with circumcision. That's because you have all perhaps been all brainwashed into that. What, that, that opens a precedent. What about circumcision in female organs? And, um, you, you, and, and another point is you're saying you, you shouldn't compare circumcision to cannibalism, but you could perhaps compare with the traditions of food wrapping in China, for example. Okay, thank you very much. So a question about circumcision, which we'll come back to in a minute. Let's go to this gentleman over here in the stripy shirt. Just staying on circumcision uh, for a little bit longer, I'm afraid. Um, there's this suggestion that, uh, two points, there's a suggestion that you wouldn't ordinarily slice bits of body from a child. Uh, I'm not too sure what the surgeons are doing. If, if that doesn't happen, because I'm pretty sure that I'm not, saying, I'm not saying it doesn't happen, I'm saying you wouldn't If we could do finish. It. Yes, sure, go ahead. So, yeah. so uh, I think we do have situations where people are slicing children entirely appropriately. And then there was the issue of consent. Uh, I wonder, should we be asking babies for consent before we carry out operations on them? And, and thirdly, when you work benefits and harms, what is your evidence of the harms of circumcision? Because a doctor would be weighing up benefits and harms before making okay. bold claims. Okay, we'll have one more that will not be about circumcision. Um, can I have the young woman here in the leather jacket? Thank you. Um, my question is about why, well, how I see it is that Christianity is seen to be persecuted the most um, to do with, for example, LGBT and freedom of speech and everything. We must bow down and and accept your, your ideas and your opinions, but you don't accept ours, which has been a tradition for so long. And I also think that it's, I have to state that Muslims do not get persecuted as much as we do. They're, they're, it's like the country's afraid to persecute Muslims the way they persecute Christian, Christianity. Anybody who wants to reject LGBT, reject any equal, Anything that is not of Christianity, basically, everybody has a problem with it. But if it's Muslims, we must bow down to them and just listen to them and let them do what they need to do. If they want to wear burqas and cover their faces and go to malls and do whatever they have to do, nobody has a problem with it. But if we don't want to give a cake to somebody because we don't agree with it and we don't want to write what we, what we don't agree with, it's, it's a massive problem compared to Muslims and everybody else. That's my question. Okay, okay Stephen, yeah. um, just to, to give you a, a moment on that. Um, so this, uh, this idea that uh, the beliefs that religious people have, you're basically saying that your beliefs are more important or stronger than their beliefs. I I should there not be a tolerance of things that even you don't believe in? Well, that's exactly what I do believe in, this tolerance. Uh, like, like this lady just said, she, she sort of uh, referenced the idea that you sort of have to accept our beliefs. We don't have to accept, you don't have to accept a thing I say, and I don't have to accept a thing you say. What, what I'm asking for is you to accept my right to say it just as I accept your right to say it. And that's, that's the bare minimum I ask for. Uh, I mean, but going back to the, the gentleman's strange conflation with medically necessary procedures and, and ritual circumcision, I, I, don't think, I don't think you can really compare them to, and obviously you can't get consent from a, a baby who needs a, a possible life-saving um, operation, but I, I just want to make this distinction between medically nece necessary circumcision, which does happen and is perfectly justified, but what I'm talking about is circumcision purely and solely for ritual purposes, which is completely unnecessary mm -hmm. um, from a medical standpoint. So I okay. hope, that, hope that answers your question. Ed, um, this conflation of uh, female circumcision with male circumcision, is that f unfair from your perspective to, or foot binding, uh, you know? Yeah, I mean, uh, the, the female circumcision is sadly a, a, an African cultural practice and you, you know most Muslims across the Arab world, be they in Indonesia, you know, North Africa or uh, you know, uh, Asia, uh, don't uphold that practice. It's, it's, it's a cultural practice. Now, it's regrettable that Muslim scholars in Egypt and elsewhere have authorized that and it's wrong, it's flawed, it should be outlawed, it should be banned. And I don't think there'd be a Muslim outcry if that were to happen. So I think it's, 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 a, it's a flawed comparison. So I mean, I, without any doubt, stand firmly against female circumcision. And I think most Muslims around the world do. And as I say, it is uh, an outdated uh, African cultural practice. And, and it ought to be outdated. But with, 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 with 
my, my problem really isn't about questioning circumcision. My problem is what lies behind it. Because the moment you start going down that road, and it's, this is a very sinister agenda, then everything else comes up for questioning. You're in a position where, oh, why are we teaching boys to be like boys and girls to be like boys? Because we're imposing a cultural code. There should be non-binary appearances to children, and therefore there should be no color codes, and boys should not be boys and girls should not be girls. And that, 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 it's that modern, excessively postmodernist moral relativism that leads to a complete inner destruction of civilization that I worry about more. And I end this answer by saying this, that, you know, we have 101 problems around the world, and here we are today, sat at the Barbican, talking about cakes and circumcision. Now, think about that. I mean, it, it, you know, when, when, when Rome is burning, we're literally fiddling, and it's just, there are much more important issues to be thinking about. Okay, so the gentleman here with the beard and the glasses. Thank you. Um, I lead the political party, Justice for Men and Boys, and for the last four years, our number one campaigning issue has been to end male genital mutilation in the UK. It is a crime under the Offences Against a Person Act 1861, being at least ABH and almost certainly GBH. It is, it is um, it's an appalling thing. It's associated with a great deal of suffering. And if, and if, 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 if people don't know, um, you know about that suffering, then, then they need to find out. And our website is probably a good place to start. Okay, thank you. This gentleman here behind. Thanks. <clears throat> On the general issue of freedom of conscience and the respective rights it involves, I think the panel is fairly closely aligned. I mean, you all seem to agree that there are certain rights, prima facie rights, you know, at first rights, um, rights that we have. And then the question is where the lines to be drawn in, in the specific questions you talk about, like the gay bakery. I mean, the, the problem is it, there does seem to be a plausible, at least uh, it, it prima facie right, not to be made to do something that goes against your moral convictions, which is why doctors and nurses in this country have a right to uh, withdraw, not to refer people for abortion, although they do have to refer to somebody else, which is an additional problem, but that's, leave that aside. I mean, the real issue is, though, that if you have rights at all, you don't have a right to uh, trample on the rights of other people assuming though other people really do have the rights in question. So now the question is, what rights do these other people have? This is why the gay cake issue, I think, is so finally, uh, is so difficult to decide. I mean, I think, like uh, most of you, all in the panel, I, I think I agree with the decision that was made by the Supreme Court, um, because you can say, um, you know, it, it, having to inscribe something on a cake with which you profoundly disagree, it's not exactly stating it yourself. You could argue it's reporter speech, but it might seem to those doing it to be stating themselves. So a reasonable accommodation would be you shouldn't be made to do that. When it comes to registrars who refuse to conduct same-sex marriages or civil partnerships, that is more difficult because we're talking about a properly public service. And contrary to what Simon uh, said, I, mean, I think there's a real difficulty about allowing conscientious refusal, at least to too many people, possibly to any people, um, to perform... Um, not the refusal to perform a public service which has been legally enshrined. Mm -hmm. Very interesting points there. I'd like to go to the back of the room, please. Um, the gentleman there in the pink shirt. Yes. Brilliant discussion. Really great discussion. Uh, can I think out loud for a wee second? <clears throat> I'm trying to work out myself uh, what is secular liberalism. And I'm not quite 100% sure I agree with your opening definition of um, what it is to be secular liberal. I'd say I'm a secular liberal. I'm just going through a few different things here. I would support faith schools, for example, the right of parents to, uh, to have parental choice. And I'm a secular liberal. I think we bastardize secularism to say there's not space for that. I said, I would, I'm from Belfast myself. I've used Isher's Bakery many times. I would support their right to refuse to put the slogan on the cake. The Islington Register, which John sort of opened up with, I absolutely would defend that woman's right. But here, here's the rub. Piers in front of me says it's a public service. This is where we come to the question of can we accommodate each other? Is there space for both of us? Now, I absolutely accept that you have to have people who are going to marry the gay people, etc. But is it possible to say, OK, you might have your religious convictions, but we've got half a dozen other registers here who can carry out that sort of wedding ceremony for the gay person? I don't know if you missed the case in Glasgow with the two midwives, the two nurses, who'd been sacked. You can correct me if I've got my facts wrong. They were, they were sacked because they didn't want to take uh, part in the abortion. Um, and, and the question there is, again, do you have enough midwives and so on and so forth who are prepared to do that? And, and are you prepared to accommodate? Are you prepared to meet people halfway? Where the discussion becomes really, really difficult is if you've only got one school and you're in the middle of nowhere, 
and you say it's a religious school and people who don't want to send their kids to a religious school don't have another school to send their kids to. I have to be honest, put my hands up and say that's a toughie. But in a population of 65 million people in Britain, I think with the right spirit of accommodation and tolerance, we can accommodate a lot of these um, potential conflicts and confrontations. I'll give you another example. I'm from the, the north. Absolutely support the right of abortion. I think the churches have been a really miserable reactionary role in trying to block abortion and they're exposed for their actual position. So let's have abortion. But I also happen to know quite a few midwives, midwives and nurses who are opposed to abortion. And can we find an arrangement where those women don't have to play a part in that abortion? I think a lot of these things can be overcome with a bit of willingness in both parts. Last thing, I'm not so sure today that people who consider themselves atheist and even humanist are necessarily in the spirit of the enlightenment in which atheism first emerged. They seem to be a lot less tolerant it's interesting, can we accommodate one another? It increasingly seems, I would say, that there seems to be less of a desire to be tolerant and to accommodate one another when we disagree. Like, for example, I'm involved in abortion rights, and I know that many of my good colleagues involved in abortion rights now say you should not be able to be a gynecologist or a nurse if you want to opt out of providing abortions. I think that's really unreasonable, and I think it's unreasonable for someone to say that I will not refer to somebody else in the same hospital who will be able to provide that service for you. But increasingly, I'm finding it to be very polarized that it's either my way or the highway. Let's take someone else, sister. Yes, the gentleman, oh, sorry, the young woman over here. Thank you. Hi, uh, to pick up on the abortion topic and also with reference to what uh, Simon was saying about liberals thinking their views are superior and it's damaging free speech. I'd like to draw some attention to the ruling in Ealing where they created a buffer zone around their clinic, which I think was outrageous. Um, they weren't breaking any laws. They were peacefully kind of protesting and offering services, including financial and emotional support to women. And there were plenty of women who changed their minds about their abortion because of that activity and are probably eternally grateful and will no longer have the opportunity to access that support because of the ruling. Okay, thank you very much. I want to go to this gentleman at the back, the very back. Hiya. Um, a bit of a meta question, maybe. Is this not a case of ethnocentrism? In that, um, so, for example, uh, Stevens mentioned that this is, like, for example, sorry to bring it back to circumcision, mm -hmm. this is a, a strange practice, it's a ritualistic practice from a certain point of view. Um, but conversely, Ed just mentioned uh, with the comparison of female genital mutilation and male genital uh, mutilation or circumcision, however you want to frame it, that in Egypt uh, certain scholars did authorize it and it should be banned and outlawed. Uh, and it's, you know, why would that be considered a crime but male circumcision isn't? So I'm not trying to take sides on either side. It's just to say this whole thing seems to be more about ethnocentrism of our moral standards are superior to someone else's and should be imposed. Okay. Thanks. I, I think some people would say that male circumcision is different than female circumcision. Um, and I think that that's why some people would draw a distinction between the two. Um, okay, we want to go to this woman over here, the red top. It isn't different. Sorry, can you hear me? Male circumcision, like female circumcision, all its forms, they're not monolith, they're different. Cultures do it differently, using different tools for different reasons. What's interesting here is we have a panelist who is advocating for male circumcision, which is conducted on children, absent of consent, yet the issue raises when it's conducted on female. And he talks about that it is not, uh, it's a cultural practice, female circumcision. Male circumcision and female circumcision, although they're not both explicitly in the Quran, both are found in the Hadith. And if we defer to religious justification, Alex notes, if you look at Alex, um, uh, who, who writes an amazing uh, uh, thesis on this, you'll find that they're both admissible. Okay? And to go back to the point over there, do you think, um, my last question is, is there a gendered and religious uh, uh, discrimination when you discuss the issue of genital cutting of children. Mm. Can, I, can I come to you, Stephen, for a minute? Um, what do you do in a society, in this room, where we have people who have really different fundamental beliefs about something? Uh, without, without, you know, going into 
the circumcision and, and what it means. And, but th the fact is, these people do not agree. So how, if we were a community, how would we live together? Is it majority voting and Ed doesn't get any of his circumcision? Or is it a matter of uh, we, we allow people to have circumcisions, but you'll be unhappy, Simon, uh, Stephen, because you feel a certain way. But how do we accommodate one another? And what does it mean for, you say you're a secularist, what's it mean for secularism to not allow the freedom of religion when you disagree with that religion? What does that mean for secularism? Well, yeah, I mean, thank you for that gentleman's thoughtful question in the pink shirt. Um, I mean, I wasn't really making a case for secular, secular liberalism at the moment. At the beginning, sorry, I was more, more or less highlighting privilege uh, that the religious have in, in, in regards to faith schools, that these are public funded. Uh, so I, I'm, looking, I'm looking for a very clear separation between church and state. Um, and that, that's the difference, really. The, the, uh, what my, I draw the line is if, if a certain act would not be permitted in a secular context, it shouldn't be permitted in a religious one either. And I, I, think, I can't think of, be of a better example of that than ritual circumcision. Uh, and just picking up on this lady's thoughtful point about, um, I mean, I think she picked up on what Ed said about FGM being a majoritively African problem when, rather than an Islamic one. And, and, and I suppose both can be true, but there is... Uh, as the lady pointed out in the hadith, there is instruction for both male and female circumcision. Uh, the several schools of Islamic jurisprudence either say it's necessary or advisable. Uh, there's, you know, these record numbers of uh, cases in, in, in England of people travelling for circumcision, and, and this is majoritively Muslim. So I don't, I don't think we can kind of... I think it's strange if we're to say that it's a Muslim problem, that's bigotry, but we can say it's an African problem and that's fine. It doesn't make much sense to me. Um, in, in regards to the, what the gentleman said at the back about this possibly being an ethnocentric discussion. I, I mean, that doesn't make sense to me either. Either the, the beliefs that the religious hold are, are for everyone, for all time, as these texts claim, uh, or they are specific to one particular uh, ethnicity. So I don't, I don't quite understand where you're coming from on there. I, I look rather to the human rather than the, the ethnicity or the source or, or, the, or the culture. Mm -hmm. And I, I, think, I think there are some, uh, in contrast to what Ed said, I think there are some very serious complications and, and medical issues that can arise from, from male circumcision. Uh, and uh, I think the, if you check out the, the Secular Medical Forum there, uh, to go back to this gentleman's question about doctors, they're comprised of professionals and, and they, they've documented a lot of this issue. So it's actually quite uh, worse than most people think. People tend to assume it's benign and that's just not the truth in, in some cases. How do people, though, coexist when they disagree? Cage match. A cage match? Okay. Uh, uh, Venus, uh, you know, I can see a McGregor perspective on that, all right? Can I, can um, I just come in? Yes, you can. From, 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 uh, having just been accused of a, of a couple of points. Um, firstly, I, look, I, I come from a mainstream Sunni, Hanafi, Muslim household. doesn't get as many uh, numerically mainstream than that. And my brother and I got circumcised. We were, what, nine, ten? Uh, my sisters had earrings put in. Right. And we felt really badly for our sisters who had to go through weeks of pain and agony. I didn't want that to happen to my sisters. Similarly, my sisters thought we went through pain and agony. Now, I'm not drawing moral equivalences other than saying stuff happens when you're children and you grow up and you, come to, you accept it or you reject it or you take a position on it. But I'm not an advocate for circumcision. This is the first time in my life I'm even thinking about it. <laughs> to, or to be completely honest with you, it's just not an issue. Um, now, if I, but maybe it is for you, my friend, and good luck to you. But, but on, on the ethnocentrism issues, look, as I understand it, and I'm open to being corrected, as I understand it, female genital mutilation uh, involves the removal of the clitoris and thereby the deprivation of sexual uh, pleasure. Now, you can shake your heads, and that's, I mean, again, as I say, I'm happy to have a further conversation about this in private, but that's, that's what Ayan Hirsi Ali and others all wrote about, complained about, and rightly it should be banned, and rightly it should be removed. Now, with male genital uh, circumcision, I understand that to be removal of the foreskin in order to provide for uh, cleanliness for prayer purposes. And, and I'm defending the practice of Abraham, Ishmael, and you know, 6,000 years of Judaism. It's not a Muslim problem. We inherited that from our Jewish cousins, and we should be celebrating the fact <laughs> that, he, that he is a Muslim defending a Jewish practice that we've absorbed. And, and that's more laudable than, than saying, oh, my God, how dare you impose a moral code on children, because the slippery slope of that is to then end up in that non-binary space where we believe in nothing, and nothing is worth defending, and civilization collapses under the weight of this moral relativism. I want to go here to this woman here. 
Well, I'm absolutely with Ed on this. <laughs> and um, in fact, I was going to you draw the parallel that you just used about um, ear piercings in very young girls. And the thing that amazes me, that makes me very suspicious about the circumcision debate, actually, on both sides of it. Don't worry, I'm not going to talk a lot about the circumcision debate. But the thing that makes me very, very suspicious about it is that we just seem to have this absolute obsession with what people are doing with their genitals with this. Where, and it seems to me that it's a complete fetishization of what different cultures are doing with a particular body part that we then don't extend all the way through. I mean, it's very... And, and also, I would then move on from that to say that I think that there is also a particular fetish... I can't say the word. Fetishization of then what are seen as religious practices as opposed to broader cultural practices. So I spent a lot of time objecting about circumcision for Jews. And yet, actually, for generations in the United States, it was a really middle-class class wasp thing where young boys were routinely circumcised because it was a middle-class white thing to do. And indeed, more recently, you know, there's been discussion about whether it should be encouraged because of sexual hygiene uh -huh. issues and HIV. So the point is, is that, you know, there is a kind of reason why we oppose certain things. And I think that's what this becomes an interesting discussion about is why focus on those things. Yeah, I think, though, I, being fair, I think Stephen was making the point that he'd be opposed to it whether it was religious or not. And I think other people, some of the people feel the same way. I think of this gentleman here. Yes, sir. Um, well, just one thing I, I have a unique experience on, I guess, is I grew up in New York and I moved to the Netherlands when I was 14. I played a lot of basketball despite my vertical challenges. And I never saw a foreskin until I got to Europe. So it was, it, it, it um, you know, so, so it, was, it was certainly what you say. It was, it was just a widespread practice in the States. But anyway, so underneath all these discussions, I think that the issue is looking at oneself as opposed to looking at some bunch of practices. And there's a book I highly recommend called um, The Righteous Mind by Jonathan Haidt. And I'll give you one example, which is if Jack and Jill are brother and sister and they want to um, find out what it's like to make love to one another, and they uh, do it in complete and utter privacy. They make a pact that they'll never tell anybody. They use lots and lots of protection so there'll be no offspring. Ask yourself whether or not that was an immoral act. And, you know, I, I come from a tradition where, or I don't know, I come from my mother. You know, it's, it's, it, it, do no harm, it's okay. So to me, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's, it's not an immoral act. But I can imagine there are a bunch of people who think that it's, it's an immoral act. And I, and I think that's where we need to start, is to look at how we'll how we evaluate things ourselves. So I'll give you, a, this is kind of a, a, a tougher example, is the um, Christians went crazy in the States about the, um, whatever the, organiz the government organization is, funding arts, where somebody made a cross inside of a glass case and filled it with urine. And, you know, is that art? And, and I thought, like, what the hell? I don't care, because I'm not a big fan of organized religion. And Haight, in his, in his paper, said, well, if you don't think that's a problem, imagine it's Martha Luther King. Then I had a problem. And so then I found out that my, the, the problem is me. I, I'm tribal. You know, I, I would ask you, Ed, to just look at whether or not part of what you're saying is informed by a kind of not yet conscious tribalism. You know, and it, it, uh, anyway, so... Hold on, we'll come to you in a moment, Ed, okay? Um, can I take this gentleman here to wait for some time? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'd like to address the uh, slippery slope of Ed scene um, and uh, remind everybody that uh, Nietzsche, in predicting nihilism following the death of God, um, and we had killed him, um, uh, didn't advocate a return to religion. And what this is really all about, underneath all the examples given, is where we get our authority and where we get our stability from because we've accepted the source of our authority. We're now at a phase in human affairs where we are arguing for developing our own system of authority and finding out our own faith in ourselves. And... Um, the 
eloquence with which everybody refers to um, systems of fairness, right and wrong, deep sense of morality, none of which is derived specifically from appeals to religious texts, suggests that we can have faith in our own human ability to work out our own systems of authority, believe in ourselves, and have faith in ourselves for the future. One last thing to say, that if I were a divine being, and I'm not advocating atheism as such here, if I were a divine being, I'd be delighted to see the human race advance to a point where they were able to lay down the holy books, the texts, the tradition of the ages, work it out for themselves, do better, and give this as their gift to the God okay. that you. oversaw them. Thank you. Um, I'd like to take um, this young woman here. Thank you. Um, I have a question to you. I think Simon, right? Um, do you, it's just a curious question. Sure. Do you think the idea of um, Christian marriage is based on unity and procreativity pro like it's um, taught in Christian schools? Or is it an outdated excuse not to allow gay marriage? And do you think it's wrong in moral senses? Sorry, I just missed the first part of the... So do you think the idea of Christian marriage is based on unity and procreativity pro as it is taught in um, Catholics and Christian school? Or is it an outdated excuse not to allow gay marriage? And okay. do you think it's wrong in moral senses? Okay, we'll take that in a minute. And I'd like you to address it from a religious freedom perspective, um, if you can, um, because I think that that's where we want to get back to. I, Helen, can I ask you just the question to try to focus this again? This idea, like, uh, Simon comes up with the idea of reasonable accommodation, that these group of people do not agree on various aspects, and so can we make a reasonable accommodation, i.e., you don't want to give birth control to your employees, can you sign off on something that allows some other mechanism to happen so that your employees who want birth control can get birth control? If you don't want to bake a cake with um, I love gay marriage, um, is it okay that you don't do that, but is it okay that you don't discriminate against people who come into your store who want to buy cakes? How is it, how can we coexist together when people have such strong feelings on both sides? I, I think, as, as I said before, often it, it does have to come down um, to the individual circumstances. It has to be argued out on each case when we're, we're talking about what are we going to accommodate. Obviously, um, some people want their belief uh, that, um, that contraception is a problem to be accommodated. Other people want their need for contraception to be accommodated. So really, this isn't something I don't think we can put a big overarching... Um, umbrella over and say yes this is how we do it we have to have certain principles of trying to let people do live as they wish to live without impacting others and um, and doing and doing the best we can but I, I don't have the answers and I don't believe anyone who says that they they do have one rule fits all but I, I was hoping to, to speak to the to the issue of ethnocentrism mm -hmm. Yep. which was coming up because I, I think that this is a much bigger um, factor on a cultural level because um, when the young woman at the front here um, said that um, she felt there is much more accommodation of Islam going on than Christianity, I think we're looking at different levels here because it's very, it seems on the surface very strange to say that a country which has a state religion, has bishops in the church, has 15 minutes Christian worship in schools, uh, is a, oppressing Christianity. It does seem to have a very much of a privilege. But when we're coming down to the cultural level, what we are finding a lot of the time is that there is less sympathy for Christianity than for Islam. And this is coming from our history of having, being a part of an empire which has trampled other beliefs. So we are perhaps overreaching in some extent, some um, elements of us in order to accommodate uh, cultures that, that we have um, historically been, been very um, exploitative and, and contemptuous about. So, Ed, without getting into the religious oppressive Olympics, um, is, is there, do you have a feeling about sort of whether, you know, the way different religions are perceived, whether there's an element of victimhood that religion is proclaiming um, in order to preserve or defend itself against an increasingly 
a secular, atheistic world in which religion feels pushed to the side um, or feels that it has to bend the knee, literally, to accommodate um, uh, other beliefs? I mean, Muslims don't recognize the picture that you painted that, uh, in, in, the, in the sense that um, uh, Muslims are somehow accommodated more than Christians or Jews or Muslims are somehow freer to say and do uh, religious practices more than others. And I think most Muslims, uh, you know, whenever they polled, be it here or the US or in Europe, feel degrees of anti-Muslim sentiment and Islamophobia being at uh, ex ex exceptionally high levels. Now, there are explanations for that. There's a, there's a correlation between Muslim populations and uh, other political, economic, and social problems. So uh, th there's truth to both sides. Yes, there's Islamophobia, but there are reasons for that Islamophobia. And yes, there is a belief that Muslims are, are, are given a, a free pass, and there are reasons for that belief. But I think ultimately, there's something else at play, and that something else is that the Enlightenment's clash was with Christianity. It was not with Islam. Voltaire's disputes and problems were with the Catholic Church. Rousseau's fundamental questions were to Catholicism. His rejection was of Christianity. The Enlightenment was born within that Christian tradition. It was the church that put Galileo on trial. It was the church that killed Bruno in the year 1600 for wanting to become more like the ancient Egyptians. So th this is a 600-year-old debate and discussion that's played out here in Europe, 600 because it's been going on since the 1400s, whereas the, 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 the interaction with Islam in the West is relatively new as Muslims being here in the, in, in the West. And to that extent, I would say that Islam is, and I would say that as a tribal and a Muslim of conviction, uh, that Islam doesn't have the problems that Christianity had or has. You know, whether it's the virgin birth, or whether it's Jesus coming back to life, or whether it's Jesus being killed on the crucifix, and a whole range of other beliefs that stem from that. So the, the debate and uh, difficulty around Islam is actually observational and to do with rituals and you know, whether you, know, you, you should wear a hijab or whether you should wear a face veil or whether... You know, it's, it's a different type of debate. So that's why I think Islam is seen to be given a free ride because the discussions with Islam and Muslims different. are different. Okay. Mm. Simon, yeah. can you tell us... You know, we were asked a question about sort of gay marriage and how that's perceived uh, as opposed to heterosexual marriage. Sure. Is it increasingly difficult for you and your evangelical friends to exist in a world in which if you say something like, I don't believe that a man and a man or a woman and a woman can get married, mm -hmm. or indeed, uh, if you were to say something like, um, I think homosexuality is wrong or sinful, Mm -hmm. Is it increasingly difficult to do that? And do you and your, and your, your um, fellow believers perceive that as being oppressive, that you are not entitled to express your heartfelt belief if you believe such things? Yeah, thanks. I'm just going to roll back slightly because I think there's a few points that I'd just like to wrap up in answering okay. that. You know, obviously, Helen alluded to you know, the answer to the question about how do we live together. And I think the starting point, from my view, is that we have to learn together learn to live together and come to the understanding in a plural public square that we will go to work, we will live with and by and interact with people of whom, of whom have views that we vehemently disagree with. Uh, and there is no right to be offended, although I say from a Christian point of view there are many reasons not um, to gratuitously offend. So I think that the idea of reasonable accommodation is a very fruitful one. Now, as Helen said, there's no black and white solution here. There is no magic legal um, algorithm. And in fact, evangelicalism has a very rich history of nonconformism uh, in, in terms of the suffragettes and so on and so forth. That said, we have to get to the point where we have to learn to live in a society where, absent of inciting violence, there has to be the right to be wrong. So on the public service point, the gentleman made a very good point. It's in, imperative when you're talking about accommodation that the service can be provided. But in Islington, that was never in question, and it was only two colleagues that raised a grievance because they were so upset that the accommodation had been given to Mr. the Daily. And I think that's a very corrosive ideological viewpoint, this, this idea of ideological purity that we can have one, you know, it's not diversity, it's monotony, that we can have one sort of new orthodoxy, and that is that. And again, I was very uh, disheartened uh, by a num the silence in some quarters, not all, uh, of free speech advocates to see the situation outside Ealing. Now, 
for the avoidance of doubt, I do not condone harassment. I do not condone uh, any crimes. But in that situation, there was not really, that wasn't there on the facts, the case is going up to the Court of Appeal. And what you had is people's rights to protest, associate, and freedom of speech, expression, association, wiped away in a stroke by someone who's saying, well, I feel that the fact that someone's on the opposite side of the road is, is a form of offence to me. Um, so I think that's something that we need to sort of get over, that we are going to live in a plural public square. We have to, to coexist with people with whom we profoundly disagree. And I think the whole... Um, trend towards identity politics, if I can put it that way, um, is, is, is something which is very, very challenging to that notion. Okay. And would you address the question then that I asked you? That yep. It, with regards to yeah. being able to say, sure. I'm against, I yeah. think homosexual, homosexuality is sinful. Yeah. Um, do, do you and your friends find that difficult mm -hmm. to actually say that? Mm -hmm. And do you feel that the response that people give you is um, correct? That I is it fair and justified to say someone's a homophobic, for example? Well, I mean, Section 29 of the Public Order Act gives you the right to publicly uh, say that. It's an ex ex explicit uh, exemption added. However, that doesn't mean it's not problematic in, in, in practice, um, because people, like you say, automatically say, well, that's phobic or that's, that's, that's hate speech. The sad reality is there are problems there, in the sense that every single UK street preacher that we've known um, who has been prosecuted for, for such matters, um, bar one who died awaiting appeal, who Peter Thatcher was going to give evidence for, uh, basically has been acquitted. Now, I don't think a system where you have to go to appeal in the Crown Court and the, and the process acts as a punishment in terms of your career or your job is necessarily a conducive to a public square. So it all goes back to that idea of offence uh, and that, well, you know, I can't believe that someone is saying that. Well, there's no right not to be offended, but many reasons not to produce offend. Okay. At the back, there's a gentleman who's been trying to get in for a while. Yes, you, sir. Hi there. I just wanted to say that um, uh, this is about progress, really, and a lot of the things that we're talking about today would never have been dreamt of a hundred years ago and I think that you know that the whether it's about circumcision or, or other things that, that affect all of us um, we are making huge progress and whether that's uh, men want to marry men women want to marry women and I think that is great stuff and that is that is a fantastic thing, and that is because of free speech and free thought that has come about through uh, secularism. And I think without some of those aspects, we wouldn't be allowed to be talking about those things. My final point is that, um, you know, that there are huge implications for um, the education of children and the development of children, especially in, um, you know, current governments that are really tied down by religious dogma that, that is really holding a lot of um, society back, actually. Can I, can I just ask you, just as a follow-up, you say it's progress that uh, now we've reached the point whereby men can marry men and women can marry, marry, marry women. There's more tolerance of that. Mm. Do you think it's not progress that people who say that they're against that um, feel that their right to express that view is... Um, is is silence. Do you, do you think that that is, is a lack of, pro well, well, there's progress in, in, in yeah. positively seeing what you believe in mm. carried out. Other people who feel differently to that, mm. do you think that that's regressive, that they, that they yeah. would say that? You do. Because, you know, just going back to the point very early on, just because we've always done things a certain way doesn't mean they're right. So, <laughs> if we got to this point and you know, I, I, the only analogy I can, that's coming to my head is that, you know, certain groups of people have only been allowed to vote in the, hundred, in the last hundred years. That's completely barbaric these days. You know, that, that, it's not even a, a thought. And we celebrate the fact that everybody can vote, mm -hmm. whether that's, you know. Okay. But uh, my point is that actually, just because things have always been allowed and we've respected things that have been allowed because of religion, it doesn't mean they're right. Mm -hmm. Okay. I want to come here to the front, uh, the woman here. Yeah. Yeah, I just wanted to say that I do think that there's an obligation in these debates to actually be honest and straightforward about the information that you give. And Stephen, I do just want to make the point that the points that you were making about the uh, protests at the abortion clinic in Ealing, just simply not true. And the heartbreak for me 
The heartbreak for me as a provider of abortion services and as someone who is hugely committed to free speech and political protest is that we have not been able to work in the way that the guy over here was basically suggesting and that when the Good Council Network were actually asked if they would, in a spirit of accommodation and tolerance, move the protest 50 yards down the road so that they were not distressing women coming in an into an abortion clinic. They declined to do so precisely because what they were intending to do was to grandstand on this issue. Okay. So let's all work in a spirit of tolerance. Okay. Uh, I'd like to come to this young gentleman here. He's been waiting for a while. Yes, um, I would just like to also kind of echo the point of the man at the back about progress. If you look back at a few hundred years, the fact that it was legal for, um, for Catholics to burn Protestants at the stake and over the next three, few hundred years that's just seen as morally wrong, that's a fact, that's not really um, a, a subjective. So what I'd like to ask actually, perhaps a more op optimistic point, is that in the future do you think this progress would continue? The fact that we're now more of a level playing field or on more of the same page. I know there are still issues, but do you think these issues will begin to dissipate in the future? I think that will be a great question to go to the panel with, with um, as we come to the end of the program, but I would like to get in this woman here just before we go there. Sorry, just, just a really quick one. Um, I, I've noticed that a lot of the, the questions that have come up are all to do with sort of lifestyles and life choices, mm -hmm. you know, choosing to ride on a cake, you know, choosing to do certain things. I, I completely understand. Um, like the debate there is always leads to some kind of moral paradox that people have. But what if the decisions being made are uninformed? For example, just to jump into FGM for just a second, in Africa there is a tribe that believe that if they do not circumcise them, female, women don't circum, uh, castrate themselves, their clitoris is going to grow into a penis. Now that is an uninformed decision that is, that is inaccurate. What do we do then? You know, are we going to risk being ethnocentric mm -hmm. to be able to, you know, to, to be able to point out that what they're doing is wrong. So, I don't know. Okay, thank you. I want to start, I want to start off with um, Helen as we sort of reach our conclusion and go across the panel. Helen, are you op optimistic when it comes to sort of progress continuing, um, our ability as humans to solve these very complicated cultural, religious, um, and belief divisions between us? Are you optimistic for the future, or do you see things becoming worse between us all as we try to coexist? I, I, I am a, a bit of a pinkerite, and I, I have to say I am hopeful that the, the moral arc is going to continue, that we're going to, the, the circle of empathy is going to keep going out. We do seem to be getting more liberal, not just us, everyone, but I'm not sure that that is going to happen in the short term, and I, I think things might get, there might be more conflict. I think there probably will before it gets better. Simon, for you. I'm not particularly optimistic because I, I have to confess there are there is a sort of prevailing culture of grievance, and um, I think there are, that comes from some quarters, some religious quarters. I'm honest. Um, I just think um, that that doesn't augur well, whether it comes from religious quarters or indeed um, secular quarters. And uh, um, I'm, I'm, I'm waiting with uh, trepidations to see what happens. So, you, so you're critical of your own team, your own faith team. You feel mm -hmm. sometimes they take umbrage with things uh, unnecessarily. Yep. Well, what do you think their motivation in doing that is? It's, it, it, it's, it's mixed and it's complex, but I don't, I'm, I'm not well enamored with the language of persecution. I think when you look at you know, the idea that you know, 200 odd Christians every month you know, in, in parts of the world that Ed's alluded to, you know, there's bigger issues, if, if you like. Um, you might want, want to use the language of marginalization, but I, I think the sort of the idea of persecution um, really overblows it. Notwithstanding recent developments uh, in the United Kingdom, uh, for Christians, we still have uh, still one of the most relatively freest countries uh, in, in, in the world to be a Christian. So I, um, I, I don't necessarily buy into that sort of um, persecution narrative, and I don't think it's helpful or conducive to the common good. Stephen? We're all doomed. No. Um, I, think, I think we are making progress. Um, I think I, Ed mentioned at the beginning of the discussion that the problem is the sort of man-made interpretation of, of, of Scripture. And my issue is that the Scriptures themselves are man-made. 
and they contain all the things you'd expect from man of that period. And that's why we're struggling to reconcile them with the 21st century social attitudes. Uh, now, so, and I think the lady at the front does have a, a point in the sense that no one's afraid in this room to mock Christianity. No one's afraid to take the mick out of the Pope or Jesus or, or tell a joke. But uh, the atmosphere would change very quickly in this room if I started to make a Mohammed doodle, which don't worry, I won't. And I think that's the problem. We've made progress in one sphere, but we're not applying the same principles to another. Uh, so it's sort of like three steps forward, two steps back in that sense. Okay. Ed, optimistic for the future. How can how we approach these issues in a more intelligent way? By resorting to the power of human reason. Um, and that's not in any way in contradiction with the power of revelation or the power of faith. Uh, I mean, if you go to Westminster Abbey and you look at the tomb of the unknown soldier and there are always flowers around it and it's right in the middle so it's hard to miss you, 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 you see writing on it about the, the, the soldiers in the first world war that had died for God, for country and for king they died for something, there was something worthy of defending, they had a moral clarity it's almost impossible to imagine that there, if there was a third world war in which we had to defend western civilization secular liberalism gender equality, racial equality individualism, openness the rule of law it's hard to imagine that in the year 2021 that we would erect such a tomb and say that people had died to defend God country and queen and that's the outcome and that's the worry in my mind that Progress can easily be wound back. It's happened many a times in our history previously. And the thesis that uh, Stephen here puts forward, the logical conclusion of that is the complete loss of moral clarity, belief, and having anything worthy of defending because it's small and moral relative and life has no meaning and that's, nothing is that's worth not defending. That's not logic I recognize. Well, okay. that's the logic that... Uh, puts us in a position where we can't recognise the, the, the soldier but, and the unknown tomb. Are you, and what, are you making the claim that the only way we can arise at meaning is through religious beliefs? No, so I'm, we can't no, just no, arrive no, at no, meaning far from it. for no, its own sake? No, we, we do that through reconciliation between religion and reason, between why, revelation. Why, why, why do we have to have religion? It sounds as though we have to have a return match, doesn't it, really? Because yeah. we've run out of time, unfortunately. I think regardless of how you feel about it, which side you're on, whether you feel that um, religious freedom for religious people is under threat these days, or whether you think it's just a ruse to push through a particular self-interest, uh, um, self-serving interest, um, or an exaggeration um, of offense. I think the reality is that on both sides of the Atlantic and on other parts of the world, this question um, and debate about religious freedom is only just beginning. I believe we've just seen the tip of the iceberg with it. So hopefully going into the future, regardless of how we feel about it, I hope that we handle it in a lot better way than we seem to be doing to this point in time. I want to thank you all very much in the audience for a very lively um, debate, and I especially would like you to give a round of applause to our panellists to thank them. Thank you for listening to the Godless Spellchecker podcast. The podcast is a one-man operation, producing my spare time away from my day job, and I love making it for you. If you enjoy what you hear, please consider lending some support. The show is entirely listener supported, I don't sell anything, I don't run ads, and uh, given the alternative and unpopular focus of my content, it's very unlikely to find a sponsor. So, there are a number of ways you can support and chip in and, and help improve the show and give me more time to produce more content. You can become a patron supporter and pledge a monetary amount per month or per episode by visiting patreon.com forward slash gspellchecker. If you can't lend monetary support right now, don't worry, there's other ways you can help the podcast too. You can share it on your various social media networks, or take a moment to leave a review wherever you listen to it. Your support is massively appreciated. Thank you. Think we've all learned something here today?